Hi. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Nonny, and um, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to come here and to talk to you. Um, just basically a little bit about my thoughts on how you, the public, um, can be involved in um, training people to become doctors. But before I get into the crux of my talk, I read while I was preparing that it's important for a speaker to find some way of connecting with the audience and that one way to do that might be to, to tell a story. So um, I have a story for you. It's quite a personal story. It's the story of my first time. So, yeah, I remember it quite clearly. So it was, um, it was a Thursday afternoon, and I know this because Wednesday was, uh, Wednesdays tend to be student night, and I was feeling pretty rough. Um, so I kind of, um, I stepped up, uh, you know, I went to the door, and I knocked on the door, and I went in, and he was lying there on the bed. And uh, he just looked up at me, and he smiled. And he said, you've never done this before, have you? Oh my God. I looked at the ground and shook my head. I said, no, no, I haven't. And I'm sure he could sense my anxiety. My heart was racing. My palms were sweating pretty much like they are today. And, um, and I remember like awkwardly kind of going towards the bed and then no one allowed to turn. Went to the curtain, drew the curtain, want to keep us away from prying eyes. And then, well, just to cut what was a short story, um, a little shorter, basically by the end of all of it, I was pretty pleased with myself. He seemed fairly satisfied. And uh, later on that evening, I went to, I uh, saw my flatmate and I was like, oh, Jazz, you'll never guess what I've done today. Yeah. I, uh, I took blood from a patient, a real patient, for the very first time. That's right. So my first time story was the first time I took blood and, where, you know, the patient was, a, the, the chap, James, I'm pretty sure his name was, um, was a patient lying in a hospital bed and he knew I was coming and so on and so forth. And I think that um, James was pretty brave to let me knowingly take blood from him for the first time, because up until that point, I'd only ever taken blood from one of these. Uh, now this is called a task trainer. Um, it's essentially just a plastic arm with some fake blood in it. And if you hit the right spot, the blood comes out. And if you don't, you try again and again and again and again and again until you get it right. So my question to you is, would you ever knowingly, let the first time a student or doctor perform a procedure be on you. Now, in my current role, I'm responsible for teaching medical students um, and people who are training to become doctors and nurses. I bear witness to several, many first times. And um, it's got me kind of reflecting on my own experience as a student. And essentially, when I was uh, at uni studying to become a doctor, I was also a really keen triple jumper. And um, I used to dedicate maybe two hours of every day practicing my event. I had a really dedicated coach who would watch me, critique my performance and give me some feedback. And I got quite good at it. But I recognised that I didn't spend this much time practicing the skills that I needed to become a doctor. And it wasn't for want of trying. I wasn't a, a lazy student by any stretch of the imagination. But if you think about it, there are a huge number of skills which a doctor needs to, to, to get good at in order just to function on a daily basis. So, time is a problem. And not only that, but sometimes there just isn't the opportunity to practice this enormous, enormous number of skills. So, uh, this winter, you'll know, probably some of you have been suffered it, uh, there's been quite a bad flu crisis. And in the hospital that I work in, uh, up in Northumberland, Actually, we've had to close many of the wards to visitors. And this has also affected our students. So they haven't been able to get in on the job and learn on the job. Also, winter, worst winter we've ever had in terms of um, A&E admissions. Students um, haven't had the opportunity to be observed by doctors performing and getting feedback because there just isn't time. Patient care always has to come first. So how, what do we do? What do we do then to kind of um, get around this, to, to mitigate these barriers? Well, we can use um, a, a, a training technique, a teaching tool called simulation. And you might have heard of simulation being used to teach pilots how to fly. You know, they, they go on a, a, a flight simulator and it looks just like the real thing. A picture of one here. And if you've never even seen a flight deck, I can imagine you would, I think you could imagine that that's what a real plane looks like. And it is on the inside. 
it moves and feels like the real thing. And in medicine, we have, I guess we use simulations as well. That arm that I showed you was one such simulator. And um, rather than kind of list all the different kinds we use, I'm going to show you a short clip of a really common kind of simulation that we do. Now, while you watch this, I would like you to kind of ask yourself a couple of questions. First of all, how realistic does this simulation seem to you? Would you feel confident that the doctor in this simulation is ready to, uh, to treat you if you became unwell? The second question is how representative is the patient in this simulation of you if you were to become unwell? So. Would you mind taking a look at Eric, please? He's not looking too good. Yeah, he's a bit cyanose. Oh, right, okay. Um, fine. Um, what's he coming with? Um, they're treating him for a chest infection. Oh, right, okay. I'll have a little look. Hi there, Eric. How are you doing? My name's Nonny. I'm one of the doctors. Hi, just a bit short of breath, doctor. All oh, right, okay. Um, Chris, would you be able to get me some oxygen for him with a non rebreathe mask, please? Yes, it me. And I'll, um, we'll start off there. You're a bit short of breath. How long has that been going on for? Uh, two or three days. It just got from work today. All right, okay. I'll just have a little look at you if that's all right. To help you feel a little bit better. And I'm going to pop this on your finger. Could you do blood pressure for me, please? Have a little listen to your chest. So, what did you think? Realistic? <laughs> that patient looked like you? <laughs> Is that what you would be like in that situation? Um, it doesn't look like me, that's for sure. Okay, so this question about realism in simulation is something that's had medical educators and researchers scratching their heads for decades and decades now. Um, and as part of my research, I'm looking at uh, realism from the perspective of the learner and what do they think is realistic, people who've never really been in the real situation before. But what I've come to realise over the last couple of years now that I've been doing this research is that no one, no one has looked at the realism from the point of view of the person who actually has to experience what we do. No one's looked at realism from the point of view of the patient. Now in that simulation that was written by a doctor, for a doctor, the patient, the mannequin, was voiced by a doctor. You know, where is the humanity? Where is the real person in that? Today, we've already had two fantastic speakers earlier on talk to us about their experiences and interactions with healthcare and with their, their you know, medical problems. And yet, how, you know, how valuable would it be for us as medical educators to really harness that, um, that experience that we have, those, those insights that we, we could, you know, the insights we could gain from that? So that's why I bring this topic, which is I sometimes think a little bit niche, to this kind of public environment. Because I think as edu medical educators, we need to do more to involve the public in our, our teaching and our practice. We need to find some way to collaborate. Because whether you have already, or whether you're, we're probably going to in the future, have some interaction with healthcare, wouldn't it be great if you could bring your expertise of your condition, of your interactions to the table so that people can learn from them? Because at the end of the day, I think, we all will have a vested interest in helping those who will someday be here to help us. Thank you. No, no. Uh, first of all, I'd like to start with saying that I've got the utmost respect for you and, and all the medical staff and our doctors <laughs> really uh, putting so much work, especially in this uh, stormy and, and Harsh weather, really. Um, actually, a good point that you brought out was that doctors don't actually only have to be trained in medical procedures, you know, performing procedures, taking out blood, but also interacting with patients yeah, as well. Yeah, because if someone is, is completely freaking out because it's their first time um, getting blood taken or a more serious uh, medical uh, procedure being uh, done, 
you have to, as a doctor, uh, kind of calm the patient down and to interact with them. So I've got a question for you. Mm. Um, what is the most common uh, fear that patients have uh, when, for example, you try to take blood from them? Ooh, um, most people are scared, a lot of people are scared of needles <laughs> um, and don't like the idea of blood you know, being drawn from them. Do you know what, just to go back to your point about interaction, I think as doctors we're really bad at finding out what people's fears are and what people's um, concerns are when it comes to that sort of thing. We kind of often just, and there's many reasons for this, but often just go and get the job done and leave. And I think taking a little bit of time to find out um, what patients' fears and concerns are can do wonders for a doctor-patient relationship. So again, as part of my kind of role, I am trying to incorporate that into my teaching, but also into my own practice as well. Yeah. So how important is empathy, for example, for a doctor? Could a, could a psychopath be a doctor? <laughs> in fact, actually, in fact, on that list, uh, it, it said that psychopaths are actually really good surgeons. So. Yeah, I was just going to say that. I think if you went into a hospital, you'll find that a huge number of the doctors are probably psychopathic, um, in a good way. They channel their psychopathy, and yeah, definitely surgeons. Um, who else would like to cut people up and stitch them back together? <laughs> um, so yeah, so em but empathy is hugely, hugely important. And I think um, as, as human beings, sometimes we... It's really difficult to be truly empathic. It's really difficult to put yourself into someone else's shoes and understand what they're going through um, because we are all about our own agenda often. And the more stress you're under, the more difficult that becomes. So I think in something like medicine, yeah, it's, it's where it's most important to be emp em empathetic. empathetic it's, um, it's even it's even more difficult to do properly in it, but but yeah, get, yeah absolutely, empathy is everything. Because you probably don't want to be too empathetic as well, because then you would be kind of too kind to the patient, and you won't actually get to the procedure. You kind of have to find the balance between empathy and kind of this strict, fast-paced work of a doctor, right? Yeah, so that's the excuse <laughs> that many people use. I think that. Um, Sometimes you, yeah, there is a balance between time and understanding things from the patient's perspective. But I think medical practice is becoming, has realised that and is becoming more person centred. And I think that can only do, can only be good for the health of, of the nation, really. Perfect. Well, we'll leave it at that. Anyway, everyone, please, uh, a big thanks to Nani. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nani.